Hello again and welcome back to this course on the plain gospel and what we're supposed to do with it. We we'll encourage you to get out your workbook and also your Bible. We're going to be looking at some passages in Romans as we're studying the plain gospel. A reminder about why we're calling this class the plain gospel is because we don't want to change it in any way. Paul talked about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 17 where he talks about how he came to preach the gospel not in cleverness of speech so the cross of Christ would not be made void. And so to emulate that, we also want to pe preach the, the gospel in just its plain form. We're not adding anything. It's not about our cleverness or our ability to do well. We're, we're letting the gospel be the gospel and cha not changing anything, just, just doing exactly what the, the Bible says. So our next class is going to be in Romans. This is class number four as we talk about the, the book of Romans and how it is explaining the gospel as how we are obligated to the plain gospel. When I preach, I like to stick with one book. That's just kind of a, a style that I've developed. I work a lot with non-Christians and young Christians and jumping around from book to book is very confusing for them. But the advantage of that is when we study a subject like the gospel and we just stay in one book, each book has its own theme. And I noticed these passages that talk about the gospel in Romans has this theme of, of this obligation, a, a feeling of I'm obligated to this gospel. I want to make sure that I protect it and proclaim it the way that it should be proclaimed. So we're going to look at three main points. The first one, A, is how we are set apart for the gospel. We'll look first of all at Paul and how he was set apart. Number one, he was set apart as an apostle and bond servant of the gospel. In Romans chapter 1, this letter opens up saying, Paul, a bond servant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David, according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God, with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake, among whom you also are called of Jesus Christ. Paul starts off, he says, I have been set apart. I've, I have a special place, something that I do as an apostle. Now, Paul was one who was not an apostle in the sense that he traveled with Jesus. He did not become a follower of Christ until after Christ was already resurrected and Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. He describes the events after Jesus' resurrection in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 7, where it says, Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles, and not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. So even though Paul was an apostle, he didn't feel worthy to be one. But an apostle is one who is sent forth, one who is called to a special purpose. So he says, I am that. And I'm also a bond servant, he says in the same verse. Now a bond servant means a servant by choice. There was servanthood in the Old Testament, slavery. The, the Hebrews had slaves. But they could only keep their slave for six years. On the seventh year, called the year of Jubilee, they had to set their slaves free. They were free to go. But there was an exception in Exodus chapter 21, starting in verse 5 and 6 talks about it. It says, a slave who, as he comes to the year of Jubilee, if he loves his master, he could decline his freedom. He could say, I don't want to be set free. I want to stay in servitude. I want to continue to serve this master. And if that was the case, they pierced his ear, gave him an earring, 
and he was known as a bond slave or a bond servant. And so that's what we see in the opening of this letter in Romans chapter 1, 1, Paul calls himself a bond servant. It's interesting also, James opens his letter in James 1, 1, calling himself a bond servant. And Peter, in 2 Peter 1, 1, refers to himself as a bond servant. And Jude, in Jude 1 and verse 1, refers to himself as a bond servant. And finally, John, in the book of Revelation, the very first verse, says that he is a bond servant. All these church leaders, these, these men said they were bond servants. What they meant by that is that they served Christ as if he owned them. And they did so willingly. And of course, he did own them. What's fascinating about that is he owns us as well. If you think about it, we should be bond servants of Christ. We should be serving Christ by choice because Christ owns us. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 23 says, you were bought with a price. So if Christ has redeemed you, if he has bought you with his blood, then you are his and you are his servant. Another side point before I leave this verse, you notice the word scripture in verse 2. It says, and he was promised beforehand through the prophets, through the holy scriptures. This is a Greek word, graphe. Graphe means writing, graphics. You can kind of hear that, graphe. But it never, ever means common writing. It always means inspired by God writing. In other words, holy writ, the scriptures. The word only appears 51 times in the New Testament. Every single time, there's not an exception to this rule, every time it means inspired writing. And so that's something to watch for. Normally the word is translated scriptures, but if you see that word, it does not mean common writing. It means this is a message that is directly from God. It is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Let's go on to our second point here, number two. The gospel is about the resurrection power of Jesus, which permits us to receive God's grace. Now that's from verses four and five. It talks about how he was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection. And so the resurrection is where the power comes from. And that allows us to receive God's grace in verse 5, through whom we have received His grace and apostleship. And He brings about the obedience of the faith, and that's what we're striving for. Number three, we see this plain gospel of God's Son. This is the plain gospel. And we serve Him by preaching it. Read on with me in verse 8. Drop down to verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. For God, whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of His Son, is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you. Paul is talking about how, he says, I'm so proud of your faith. Now, keep in mind, Paul has never been to Rome, but the reputation of those Christians, and you can just hear the buzz as people are saying, boy, the church is doing well, but I wonder how it's doing in Rome. I mean, that's right there where, where Nero is, and things have got to be tough there, and everybody's saying, oh, no, no, their faith is really strong. Those brothers are doing great. And Paul was part of that. He was saying, I, I'm talking you up too. I'm, I'm really proud of how great your faith is. Because of the gospel which Paul was preaching, this plain gospel, he says, I serve God by preaching it. When Paul was preaching the gospel, verse 9, the God whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel. How did God serve or how did Paul serve God? By preaching the gospel. How do we serve God today? By preaching the gospel. And preaching doesn't mean standing in the pulpit and saying, it just means proclaiming or speaking the gospel to someone, anyone, one person or a thousand, it doesn't matter. If you are gospeling, if you're, if you're preaching the gospel, you're speaking the gospel, then you are serving God by doing so. Let's go on to the next section here, B, 
We're going to find out that the gospel is nothing to be ashamed of. Number one, the gospel is nothing to be ashamed of. It is God's power for salvation. In the same chapter, Romans chapter 1, looking at verse 16, it says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. As Paul is talking about this gospel, he says, man, I'm, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why would I be ashamed of God's power for salvation? Why would I, why would I be ashamed of love? This gospel is great. And, and shame on us when we're ashamed of the gospel, when we are reluctant to proclaim it. There is nothing to be ashamed of, nothing to be embarrassed about when we are sharing the gospel with others. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. And so we should uh, do so without reluctance at all, this preaching of the gospel. We see point two, that the gospel has to do with judgment and it has an impact on where we're going to stand on Judgment Day. In chapter 2 now, Romans chapter 2, looking at verse 14, it says, For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves. I'll explain that here in a moment. In that they show that the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience, bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. On the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. The church in Rome had Romans, Gentiles who were there, and they had Jews both in the same church. And Paul is speaking somewhat to the Jews, and he's saying, what about those Gentiles? Now, they didn't have the law, and that was always the, the thing that the Jews would, would throw up in the face of the Romans, is, you guys never had the law. Uh, you don't know how you should behave. He says, what about those Gentiles? He says, yeah, they didn't have the law, but they knew instinctively that some things are right and wrong. You know, even a person that's never read the Bible knows that murder is wrong, knows that cheating on your wife is wrong, knows that stealing is wrong. These are things that are just inherently within us. We know right and wrong. And he says, those become a law unto themselves. They're accountable for these things. And then he goes into talking about our thoughts, our conscience, which Alternately, sometimes it's accusing, sometimes it's defending us. Can you relate to that? Sometimes our, our conscience is accusing us. You did this, you did this, and you did this. Sometimes it's defending us, but it, it alternates. The conscience comes and goes. But the real judgment on Judgment Day is going to be based on the gospel. Look at verse 16. On the day when according to my gospel, and I love the fact that Paul says this is my gospel. He's not saying exclusively because Paul was constantly sharing the gospel, but he's saying, I've made this my gospel, my good news. He's going to say the same thing in chapter 16, verse 25. He says this again in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. He calls it my gospel. My gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. So here's an aspect of the gospel we need to understand. It has to do with judgment. It's going to be involved in the judgment process. And we could look at a lot of other scriptures, but basically the, the role that it plays is it's the standard by which we will be judged is the gospel. That's how important it is. I'll, I'll tie that in a little later on with some other scriptures. But know this, that if you are, if your understanding of the gospel, if it has nothing to do with judgment, you need to change the way you think about the gospel, because that has everything to do with the judgment day and the judgment of God. Number three, the gospel's response is dying to sin and being buried in baptism. In chapter six of the book of Romans and verse one, what should we say then? Are we to continue in sin so the grace may increase? May it never be. 
How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. In this passage, Paul is explaining that he says, should we keep sinning so that we get more grace? I mean, is we know, and he, he talks about this in chapter 5, verse 20, that if we sin more, we get more grace. Those of us who sin more need more grace. If you don't have very much sin in your life, you don't need as much grace. If somebody has a lot of sin, wow, they need a lot of grace. But that doesn't mean we keep sinning so we get more grace. We don't abuse grace that way. And his argument against that, he says, is we died to sin, verse 2. We died to it. We, if you're dead to something, you don't respond to it anymore. Maybe you used to respond to sin. Yes, yes, sin, let's do that. But if you're dead to sin, that means you're no longer responsive to it. You've cut that off. And I'm not talking about perfection here. I'm talking about a decision. I don't want sin in my life. I hate it. I want it out. I'm not going toward sin anymore. I'm going away from it. That's what it means to die to sin. Well, what do you do with something that's dead? You bury it, right? Well, verse 4 explains. We've been buried with him in baptism. So when we die to our sin, then we're buried in the waters of baptism. This is a response to the gospel. And the thing that happens there at the end of verse 4 is we are raised to walk in a newness of life. Newness of life. A new life. That sounds like born again, doesn't it? We're born again. We start a new life. So when we die to sin, we're buried in baptism. Then and only then are we raised to this new life. And a new life means... God gave us a life. We're born into this world. And what did we do with that life? We messed it all up. We went out and we sinned and we did things we weren't supposed to do. And, and we, we, we ruined it. And God comes along and says, you know what? Forget that old life. That doesn't even count. I'm, I'm, not even, I'm going to wipe that slate clean. Here, here's a brand new life. No mistakes. Completely clean. Completely pure. Now, when you receive that new life, what do you want to do with it? Go out and mess it out again? No. It's like, oh, I'm going to do it right this time. That's the idea of being born again. I've died to my sins. I've put sin away from me. Now I've been buried in baptism. I'm raised to walk in new life. This is the response of the gospel. Now tell me in all of that, what is there to be ashamed of? What in that message do we as Christians have to be ashamed of when we are telling that to unbelievers? We should never be ashamed of the gospel. Let's look at our third major point, C. We want to look at things from a gospel perspective. You know, sometimes when things don't look right, it's a good idea to change your perspective. Well, we're going to back up and we're going to look at things through the lenses of the gospel. And notice in these remaining verses that we're looking at how the perspective of the gospel, how that changes things. Let's start with the first one. Number one, the plain gospel projects good news for anyone who is willing to see it. Then we're going to skip a few chapters. We're going to chapter 10 and we're going to look at verse 14. How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? How will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. You may recognize that Isaiah chapter 52 verse 7. We use that in our first class. However, verse 16, they did not all heed the good news, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Now that's Isaiah 53, verse 1. Verse 17, so faith comes from hearing, and hearing 
by the word of Christ. So we're looking at this from the perspective of the gospel. Back up and look at this and look at the salvation. A person has to believe. In order to believe, they have to hear. In order to hear, they have to have a preacher. They have to have somebody that comes and brings them this message. And this message is a beautiful thing. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, he says, they did not all heed the good news. Now the word heed comes from a, a, it's a Greek word. It means to hear, but it means to hear from the perspective of a subordinate, like a slave. How does the slave listen to a master? How does he hear? Well, he's hearing to get instruction so he can go do it. He's not here and saying, well, I don't know if I want to do that or not. No. To be a servant means you're hearing with the intention of obeying. And what is it that we're supposed to obey? The good news, or in other words, the gospel. So this is a passage that is talking about obeying the gospel. So does 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 6 through 8. And so does 1 Peter 4, verse 17. I'm not going to talk about those at this time. We're going to talk about those in our 10th class. I really hope that you're going to be here for that because we're going to talk about what does it mean to obey the gospel. We're going to look at all three of these passages and tie them in with some others that we've been looking at. But for now, understand that we need to heed the good news. We need to do something with it. This class is on the plain gospel and what we're supposed to do with it. We don't just hear the gospel, we do something with it. And that's what we're going to look at. Look at it through the lenses of the gospel. We're looking from that perspective. Third thing, when you look through the perspective of the gospel, is looking at people from the standpoint of the gospel helps us to distinguish between friend and foe, friends and enemies of the church. Look at chapter 11, verse 28. From the standpoint, from the view of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. And he's talking specifically again about this whole Jew-Gentile thing and how uh, the, the uh, Gentiles were not part of the kingdom. The Jews, some of them accepted the message of Christ, some did not. And they made themselves enemies of Christ. And of course, the, the Romans were seen as enemies. But he says, when you, when you clear away all that stuff and just look from the perspective of the gospel, that will help you to see who's really with the church, who's really not with the church. In other words, who has obeyed the gospel like we just talked about? Who is in the gospel? Who is serving the gospel? Who's preaching the true gospel of the Bible. That helps us to make some discernment, some distinguishing of who is with us and who is not with us. Fourth thing from the perspective of the gospel is that every minister has this priest-like duty to share the plain gospel of God. Sometimes we look at ministers or preachers from a very worldly point of view or we have this projection of what they ought to be doing. Really, a minister should not worry about what everybody else is thinking about them. They should be seeing, what does the Bible say? And the Bible describes ministry as a priest-like duty. In chapter 15, 15 starting in verse 14, And concerning you, my brethren, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all the knowledge, and able to admonish one another. For I have written very boldly to you on some points as to remind you again because of the grace that was given me from God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest the gospel of God so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. He starts off with this encouragement in verse 14. He says, I, I have confidence in you. You are able, you are competent to admonish or to instruct one another or to counsel 
one another. This is where the idea of, of counseling within the, the church and being able to uh, give each other advice. We should be seeking advice from, from people who are spiritually minded. And he says, we, we're capable of doing this. That's what that verse is saying. He says, I've written to you boldly on some points, verse 15, to remind you again because of the grace that was given me that you are to be a minister of Christ, ministering as priest. That's an interesting parallel. When we look at the priests of the Old Testament, priests of the Old Testament were workers. They worked hard. In Matthew chapter 12, once Jesus was accused of breaking the Sabbath, you're working on the Sabbath. And he says in chapter 12, verse 5, he says, what about the priest? He says, haven't you read in the law that the priest on Sabbath duty in the temple, they desecrate the Sabbath and yet are innocent? And I use the, the New International Version translation there because I like that word desecrate. You talk about work, working on the Sabbath, what about the priest? They work like dogs, he says, on the Sabbath day. And that's the comparison he's making. A minister should be willing to work hard. And when you look at it from the perspective of the gospel, that helps us who are ministers to put that in perspective. We need to take our duties very seriously, just like a priest did in the Old Testament. When they're working around the temple and in the presence of God, they were very serious, very dedicated to what they were doing. We should be no less so under the new covenant, under the superior covenant in our perspective of the gospel. All right, two more points, and then we'll, we'll close here. Point number five, looking from the perspective of the gospel, all credit for the loss coming to Jesus needs to belong to the gospel and not to us. Staying in chapter 15 and looking at verse 18 in Romans, for I will not presume to speak anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, resulting in obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed, in the power of signs and wonders and in the power of the Spirit, so that from Jerusalem and round about as far as Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And thus I aspire to preach the gospel, not where Christ was already named, so that I would not build on another man's foundation. When people come to Christ, because we're studying with them, and across the kitchen table or wherever you're studying, maybe it's at the coffee shop, and you're just sharing the gospel, and you're watching their life blossom, and the light bulb's coming on, and they're saying, yeah, this is the way to live. Don't take any of that glory. Oh, I, I commend you for what you're doing. Amen that you are sharing your faith. But the ability is not from you. The ability is from the gospel. All you're doing is sharing the gospel. You're preaching the gospel. You're, you're gospeling. I've mentioned that word several times. I, I probably should explain. We don't use that word gospeling anymore. I found it in some old literature that used to be somewhat of a popular word. We don't say it anymore. But it's a, I, I like to use it because this is one single Greek word. It's, preach the gospel is gospeling. And so that's what we're doing. We are just sharing the gospel, but the power comes from the gospel, not from us. And so the credit really needs to go to the gospel and not to us. And that's an important perspective for us to have. One more. Number six, the gospel is able to establish us resulting in the obedience of faith. Now in chapter 16 and verse 25, it says, Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel... And there's the my gospel again. And the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past. But now is manifested. That means it's revealed. Now we can see it. And by the scriptures, and there's our word graphe again, of the prophets according to the commandment of the eternal God has been made known to all the nations leading to obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ be the glory forever. Amen. And that's how Paul closes out this wonderful letter to the church in Rome. This gospel establishes us. He says that in verse 25. 
to him who's able to establish you according to my gospel. The gospel is what establishes us. Also, it brings about, it results in an obedience to faith. Now, this was in chapter 1, verse 5, but I kind of glazed over that because I wanted to save it for the end. That's preacher's prerogative, okay? Here, he talks about obedience of faith. A great thing that comes from the gospel is it leads us to be obedient to the faith. And you want that, believe me. You don't want a faith that's not obedient. James talks about this in chapter 2, where he describes a, a man who has faith, but he has no deeds. And he asks the question, can such a faith save him? The answer to the question is no. It can't save him. Our faith needs to be backed up by our works. Now, the works don't save us. It's the grace that we receive through the faith. But works shows that we are obedient. And then he says in James chapter 2, verse 26, For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. And so looking from the perspective of the gospel, one of the beautiful things that it does is it helps us. It leads to obedience of the faith. What a beautiful blessing. Are you starting to see how wonderful this plain gospel is? When we get back to the basics and we just look at what does the Bible say and, and wipe from our minds our traditional ideas or, or things that we projected on or, or think the gospel is about, the gospel is really something that we should be obligated to and that we should understand the world. We should look at the world from, through the, the eyes, the, the, the lens of the gospel. And that will change you in a wonderful way. I've taken enough of your time. I appreciate that so much. We're going to look at another class next week. We'll be, or in the next class, we'll be in 1 Corinthians. And so we're going to be looking at the core of the gospel there. Hope that you'll join me then. And until then, God bless.